Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in the Cardiovascular Connections 2022 series. Today's webinar is titled COVID-19, Endotheliitis, and Long-Term Cardiovascular Effects, featuring Dr. Guto Montezano, who was a researcher or a research fellow at the University of Glasgow, but recently started a new position as a research associate at McGill University Health Center. Today, he will discuss his research that investigates the role of endothelial inflammation and ACE2 biology in COVID-19 infections and the resulting long-term effects. Before we get started, I just want to take this time to acknowledge our partners at the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research and all of our series sponsors for helping to make these events possible. And without any further delay, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Guto Montezano. Guto, take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I would like to uh, start by uh, saying thank you to the American Physiological Society, to the European Council on Cardiovascular Research, and to Inside Scientific Seminar uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share with you our work on ACE2 and how ACE2 may contribute to SARS-CoV-2 induced endothelial cell inflammation. So first, uh, I would like just to share with you uh, some uh, notes on COVID-19. And COVID-19 is a primarily respiratory disease that has been associated with severe cardiovascular risk. So uh, people that have or had COVID-19 usually are, have associations with many different cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, stroke, kidney injury, and cardiac dysfunction. And the mechanisms by that are still under debate. And there are many, if you look at the literature, there are many different mechanisms being suggested. But from a vascular point of view, endotheliitis or endothelial cell inflammation as one of the most extensive mechanisms being described or studied. And how endothelial cell inflammation is caused, we still don't know. Again, there's many different uh, proposals of uh, different mechanisms, but increased oxidative stress or decreased nitroxide production are or seem to be related to this and also lead to vascular damage and dysfunction that we usually observe in COVID-19, leading or uh, causing this association between COVID-19 and cardiovascular diseases. So what is interesting in the vascular perspective is that in the viral entry mechanism, uh, the spike protein present in SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2. And this interaction between the spike protein that has a receptor binding domain to ACE2 with ACE2 causes the activation of other pathways or other mechanisms that will lead to the internalization of this complex. And the decrease in vascular ACE2 or uh, the, internalization, the internalization of the virus ACE2 complex activates a series of uh, pathways that will increase the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines or other molecules that will then induce endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, and impair vascular tone. And all of these are hallmarks for the pathophysiology of cardiovascular complications. Now, talking more specifically on ACE2 and how ACE2 is important to the vasculature, we know that ACE2 is an important enzyme that will lead to the production of angiotensin 1 to 7. And angiotensin ACE2, angiotensin 1 to 7, actions in through the mass receptor as part of the protective axis of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So ACE2 here, and especially in the vasculature, breaks down angiotensin 2 which is deleterious to the cardiovascular system and the vasculature, to form angiotensin 1 to 7, which is protective. But ACE2 is not only an enzyme. Yes, it is an important enzyme in the cardiovascular system, but other studies start to demonstrate that ACE2 has non-enzymatic function in other tissues. And a few examples are here to your left of this schematic. 
where I showed that ACE2 is important to the transport of amino acids in kidneys and intestines. Also, it's important to insulin secretion in the pancreas and is important as a receptor for SARS-CoV-2 or uh, SARS-1. So these studies started to demonstrate, so they show that there is a non-enzymatic function for ACE2 that's independent of angiotensin 1 to 7 production. And that's exactly what we asked in this project. We asked the question of what if ACE2 has more effects in SARS-CoV-2 induced endothelial damage that's more than just being a receptor to participate in the viral entry mechanism. So talking about the word receptor here, so we, we asked the question whether ACE2 would have, let's say, a receptor-like activity. So to start like understanding these effects or uh, to answer our questions, we first exposed microvascular endothelial cells or human microvascular endothelial cells to recombinant S1 protein. So at first in the graph that I'm showing here to the left, we did a concentration curve where uh, for recombinant S1 protein to determine the best concentration where we can see a robust and sustained inflammatory action. And in this graph here, I'm showing to you that at 0.66 micrograms per ml of recombinant S1 protein was enough to induce an increase in gene expression of TNF-alpha, but also other cytokines that I'm not showing you here, such as IL-1 beta, IL-6, and MCP-1. So we, once we define this concentration, we continue with our experiments where, again, we expose these endothelial cells to recombinant S1 protein, but in the presence of absence of an inhibitor of ACE2, we also use an activator of ACE2, and you're going to talk about that later in the presentation, and also in the presence of absence of a downregulation of ACE2 by sRNA. We perform some short-term experiments to look at signaling pathways that are important to endothelial cell biology. They are detailed here in this slide. But we also look at long-term uh, experiments where we look at the production of inflammatory markers and other markers of endothelial cell biology and damage. We collected the media of these cells that were exposed to recombinant S1 protein to measure microparticles, which is a marker for endothelial cell injury. And we also performed some ELISA measurements to confirm our uh, RNA data and inflammatory cytokines. But in addition to that, we also exposed the cells to SARS-CoV-2, the virus itself, and just to a pseudovirus. And these experiments were done in collaboration with University of Glasgow researchers from the Center for Virus Research. So at first, we uh, observed that at 5 and 24 hours incubation, recombinant S1 protein was able to increase inflammation in these human microvascular endothelial cells. Starting from your left to your top left, we saw an increase of IL-1 beta, VK1, TNF-alpha, and in the bottom graphs, IL-6 and MCP-1. So recombinant S1 protein induced a robust or inflammatory response in these cells. And this was recapitulated when we uh, incubated these cells with the, the SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus. We also observe a robust pro-inflammatory effect where the pseudotype, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pseudotype, increased IL-6, VK1, and MCP1 mRNA expression. And that was not observed in the control pseudotype that lacked the, uh, the S1 protein, so it didn't have potential to bind to ACE2 in these cells. So further, we asked the question whether these effects were specific to these microvascular endothelial cells or, and to do that, what we've done is we repeated these experiments in other types of endothelial cells. And here in this slide, I'm showing you our data, like two uh, examples of our data for the lymphatic endothelial cells, where again, recombinant S1 protein increased the mRNA expression of IL-16 on your graph to the right, to the left, and MCP1 here in the graph to the right. 
And this was not only in microvascular endothelial cells, but also in endothelial cells from large arteries. So in orange here, in the two graphs here to your left, we see the effects of recombinant S1 protein increasing IL-6 in the top and MCP1 in the bottom in the aortic endothelial cells. While in pulmonary endothelial cells, we see the same effects, the same pro-inflammatory effects of recombinant S1 protein in IL-6 and MCP1 mRNA expression. So once we see an increase in mRNA expression of these cytokines, as I mentioned to you, we collected the media of the cells that were exposed to recombinant S1 protein. And what we observed is that in microvascular and lymphatic endothelial cells, recombinant S1 protein was able to in increase the release of IL-6 on top and MCP1 in the bottom, as well as in aortic and pulmonary endothelial cells, similar effects, similar pro-inflammatory effects by increasing IL-6 and MCP1 release. So this means that there is no difference. So it is an endothelial cell effect, but it, uh, it's the same effect in different cells from different vascular beds. So many studies started to demonstrate that this cytokine storm or this increase in the production release of many different pro-inflammatory cytokines can lead to other effects such as thrombosis. And um, a particular study started to demonstrate that cytokine storm, more specifically an increase in IL-6, may lead to the increase in the expression and release of PI-1, which is an important molecule in inducing or facilitating thrombosis. And the study from King and colleagues demonstrated that PI-1 levels in the, serum, in the plasma of COVID-19 patients is increased. And once you treat these patients with IL-6 antagonism, there is a decrease in the levels of PI-1. So confirming this relationship or showing uh, that there is a relationship between IL-6 to the production of PI-1. In our scenario, we looked at thrombin expression here in your graph to your left, but we didn't see any increase induced by recombinant S1 protein when we actually saw a decrease in thrombin 1, thrombin uh, mRNA expression. But in terms to, of PI1, what we observed there was an increase in PI1 induced by recombinant S1 protein. So now we start to question. So we're ready to move on and uh, start to answer our question whether ACE2 will play a role in these effects. And there are two ways that ACE2 could play a role in these effects, these pro-inflammatory effects of recombinant S1 protein. One of them is by loss of the enzymatic function, where we have less production of angiotensin 1 to 7 and more bioavailability of angiotensin 2, inducing inflammation. Or we may have a direct regulation of signaling where ACE2 is behaving like a receptor or has, have, has receptor-like activity. So to do that, to study this enzymatic versus non-enzymatic function of ACE2, we perform the same experiments in the presence of the pharmacological inhibitor for ACE2, MLN 4760, or the activator of ACE2, Ds. We also perform some key experiments with ACE2 sRNA, so we knock down the ACE2. So first, here we're looking at the experiments. Uh, before we look at these experiments, what we are going to see, what we um, checked, was whether ACE2 or recombinant S1 protein would change or uh, the expression of ACE2. And as you can see here, it didn't see any differences in the expression of ACE2 by the recombinant S1 protein, whether or not in the presence of a, an ACE2 inhibitor. And the ACE2 inhibitor itself didn't decrease ACE2 expression. Now, when you look at the activity of ACE2, we didn't see any effect on recombinant S1 protein, so no changes in ACE2 activity, but we saw a reduction in ACE2 activity by the ACE2 inhibitor, MLN4760, as expected. 
Now, what about the effects of uh, ACE2 inhibition and S1 protein induced inflammation? Here in our first graph to your uh, left, what we see is that the recombinant S1 protein increases first ICAM1 expression, and in the second graph, by one expression. And this increase was ACE2 dependent because the inhibitor of ACE2, MLN4760, decreased the effects or blocked the effects of recombinant S1 protein. But we, when we looked at the release of uh, cytokines, such as IL-6 and MCP1, we still see a pro-inflammatory effect of recombinant S1 protein, whether or not ACE2 was inhibited or in the presence or not, or not of MLN4760. So what about ACE2 activation? As you can see in the first two graphs to the left, the top one is VCAM1 and the bottom one is TNF alpha. The effects of recombinant S1 protein by increasing those two pro-inflammatory molecules was not inhibited or potentiated by these or by ACE2, activity, uh, ACE2 activation. And the same was observed for MCP1 and IL-6. No changes on the effects of recombinant S1 protein. So suggesting that ACE2 activation or the enzymatic function of ACE2 may not be related to uh, recombinant S1 protein induced inflammatory effects. So now to further confirm or to understand better whether the non ACE2 would have a non enzymatic uh, participation in this process. So as I mentioned to you, we've done some ACE2 sRNA studies, and in the graph here to your left, we see that our uh, technique or protocol decreased ACE2 expression in this human microvascular endothelial cells. Now, when you, we looked at ICAM1 expression, we confirmed our pharmacological data, pharmacological inhibitor data, where the ACE2 sRNA was able to block the effects of recombinant S1 protein. And in addition to that, when we looked at IL-6 uh, release, we saw that the ACE2 sRNA was able to block the effects of recombinant S1 protein. Moreover, the sRNA by itself was able to decrease basal levels of IL-6. And this is worth it to notice as well, the same effect for ICAM-1, going back here to the ICAM-1 graph. So ACE2 controls not only the basal levels, but also inhibits the effects of recombinant S1 protein. But we didn't see any effects of ACE2 SRNA on S1 protein inducing MCP1 release. Now, in terms of signaling pathways, we looked at the activation of NF-kappa-B, which is an important pathway leading to pro-inflammatory markers production. And as you can see here in the bottom graph, uh, we have an increase in NF-kappa-B phosphorylation by S1 protein. And then this was not present when we knocked down ACE2. So this suggests that ACE2 does play a role or have a role in uh, SARS-CoV-2 recombinant protein, S1 protein induced inflammation. Now, we know that many other functions of endothelial cells may be altered in COVID-19, not only inflammation, but also proliferation and vasodilation, because endothelial cells are extremely important to regulate vascular tone, and for that, they produce endothelial cell-derived factors leading to vasodilation. But first, let's look at proliferation. ERK12 or the MAP kinase ERK12 is very important for pro-proliferative responses. And as you can see here in the graph to your left, the bar graph, we see an increase in the ERK12 activation that was induced by S1 protein. And this was not inhibited by the sRNA for ACE2 was actually potentiated by ACE2 sRNA. And basal levels were also increased when ACE2 was taken out of the picture. We also have done some studies looking at cell behavior and cell uh, movement 
uh, proliferation. And as you can see here, the recombinant S1 protein increased cell proliferation and this was not altered by the inhibition of the pharmacological inhibition of ACE2. So demonstrating that whatever changes in, in the cell proliferation induced by recombinant S1 protein was independent of ACE2. Now, what about the vasodilation or markers of vasodilation uh, responses? Here, we only looked at the phosphorylation of ENOS which is important for nitric oxide production and vasodilation, uh, endothelial-dependent vasodilation. And as you can see here, we didn't see any changes in phosphorylation or of the uh, activation sites of ENOS uh, with recombinant S1 protein plus or minus ACE2 sRNA. So now we know that uh, in these cells or in our experimental approach, we only observed pro-inflammatory effects of ACE2 with recombinant S1 protein stimulation. So what were the mechanisms? And we know that in COVID-19, endothelin-1 system or increased production of endothelin-1 was suggested, as well as I mentioned to you in the beginning, oxidative stress. So we then looked whether these two were involved or were possible mechanisms related to ACE2 regulation of uh, S1 protein-induced inflammation. And when we looked at the production of endothelin-1, either by assessing the mRNA levels of pre-pro-endothelin-1 or measuring the levels of endothelin-1 in the media of cells exposed to recombinant S1 protein, we didn't observe any differences. So endothelin-1 may not be related to these effects. But we also, looked at draw generation, and we didn't see any effects of recombinant S1 protein, not only in the production of superoxide, but as well as in the production of H2O2, no changes by uh, S1 protein. And we didn't see any changes in antioxidant expression. So antioxidant enzymes that are responsible for uh, superoxide uh, degradation or H2O2 degradation as well as antioxidant enzymes are important to the H2O2 degradation, but also a reduction of uh, oxidation of proteins. So it seems here with this data that oxidative stress may not, may not be an important mechanism for the inflammatory effects of S1 protein that we've seen here. So we then looked at the formation of microparticles because microparticles are markers of endothelial cell injury that will participate in pro-inflammatory mechanisms or in, uh, responses, as well as endothelial dysfunction. So when we looked at the total microparticles uh, number, we saw an increase induced by recombinant S1 protein, and this increase was actually inhibited by ACE2 sRNA. So showing that there is microparticles formation, and that seems to be ACE2 dependent. So we then uh, isolated these microparticles and checked and uh, asked the question whether these microparticles would be carrying ACE2. Uh, because as you can see, uh, there is some data showing that in COVID-19, ACE2 shedding is increased. So as you can see here in the graph and the black bars on your left, the S1 protein increased ACE2 expression in microparticles released uh, when the cells were exposed to the recombinant S1 protein. So we then know, we know that this microparticles can carry proteins that are informative of where, which area in the cell membrane these particles were formed. So we question whether uh, we're, be, we're able then, if we can identify um, the proteins in these microparticles, we will be able to understand whether ACE2 comes from a specific area that's important to cell signaling control. And as you can see here, we start to observe that in addition to expression of ACE2, we also have expression of flotilin-2 
which is a marker of cavioli or lipid rafts, which is a signaling hub in the plasma membrane of endothelial cells or any other uh, cells. So then here we start to understand uh, whether that ACE2 may be part of a signaling hub. And this is how ACE2 then may be regulating these responses uh, induced by the recombinant S1 protein. So to understand whether ACE2 is uh, a signaling protein, what we've done is we've performed a proteomics study where we immunoprecipitated ACE2, we co-immunoprecipitated ACE2. And, the, and our objective here, our aim, was to try to identify interact proteins and try to uh, understand whether this uh, interact proteins would help us to know which signaling pathways may be regulated by ACE2. So what we were able to see is that uh, with the, this co-IP proteomics, we were able to identify 216 interacting proteins that were important to cell signaling, RNA, and protein synthesis. And a lot of these proteins, we're still analyzing the data, uh, but a lot of these proteins are involved with uh, virus-induced effects, but also pro-inflammatory effects in these endothelial cells. So this is not the only study that starts to show that ACE2 is associated with cardiovascular signaling. In a different study in human heart failure, um, researchers demonstrated that uh, proteomic analysis of soluble ACE2 was associated with different mechanisms that we uh, observed in our proteomics. And that was in actin uh, cytoskeleton signaling, EF, EIF2 signaling, protein ubiquitination, and the MAP kinases, including uh, inflammation. So in another set of proteomic analysis, what we've done is that we stimulated cells with recombinant S1 protein and looked at the total proteome. And by doing that, we're able to identify differentially expressed proteins that were uh, regulated by the S1 protein. And as you can see here, we have a list of proteins that are important for cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and FFB signaling, MAP kinase activation, inflammation, and virus transcription. And I just want you to pay attention to ICOM1 here, which is one of the proteins that we've seen before that ACE2 plays a role in the regulation of uh, that, that inflammatory marker induced by S1 protein. But now pay attention here to the virus, trans virus transcription. We, we asked the question whether, okay, so is these effects of ACE2 dependent on virus transcription or uh, viral replication? And that's what we've done uh, the replication studies in these cells and what I'm showing you here. So as you can see here, so this human microvascular endothelial cells, they were exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And while we see an increase in virus replication in viral E cells, which are the control cells, epithelial cells, we didn't see the same results. So we didn't see any replication of SARS-CoV-2 and human microvascular endothelial cells. So this shows to us that the effect or the regulation of ACE2 in this pro-inflammatory effect was not dependent on viral replication. So this makes it stronger, the notion that ACE2 may be having this receptor or non-enzymatic uh, effects in endothelial cells, which is additional to the enzymatic function. So in conclusion, what we start to show here is that recombinant S1 protein from SARS-CoV-2 activates NF-kappa-B, induces inflammation, and increases microparticles formation in human microvascular endothelial cells independent of viral infection. infection. We also showed that ACE2 seems to control recombinant S1 protein-induced damaging effects in these cells, which is independent 
of its enzymatic activity. So in addition to converting angiotensin to, to angiotensin 1 to 7 and so on, ACE2 seems to be interacting with other proteins or have receptor-like uh, function related to cholesterol-rich domain, cytoskeletal biology, the ubiquitination pathway, and RNA protein synthesis. And this is not the first study that show a deleterious effect or a possible deleterious effect of ACE2. A previous study in 2008 by Slimmer and colleagues demonstrated that in human carotid atherosclerotic lesions, ACE2 expression is increased. So in advanced lesion, there is an increase in the expression of ACE2 in form cells and vascular smooth muscle cells. And they also observed that in early lesions, there is an increase in ACE2 expression, not only vascular smooth muscle cells, but also in endothelial cells. And what was interesting is that the ACE2 expression was much higher compared to ACE expression, and ACE2 activity was also increased and variable throughout the, uh, the advancement of the lesion between early versus uh, advanced uh, lesions. So this study help us uh, also shows to us that ACE2 uh, may have deleterious effects in the cardiovascular system or the vasculature that may not be related to, um, may not, may be or may not be related to ACE2 activity. And what we bring here is uh, a perspective where ACE2 may be contributing to inflammation through a receptor-like uh, function. So as a final conclusion, our findings suggest that vascular inflammation in COVID-19 involves, involves the activation of ACE2 mediated pro-inflammatory signaling that may be unrelated to viral uh, replication. And with that, I would like to thank you, the team that has helped me to uh, push further at this uh, study. Thank you to our collaborators in different institutes at the University of Glasgow. Thank you to the funding that was able to acquire to finance this study. And thank you for you to be uh, listening to me. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay. Thank you so much for that presentation, Guto. Um, so the first question here is uh, endothelial cells are also important in the regulation of vascular tone and vascular smooth muscle cell biology. Do you have any data on how the S1 protein may be inducing deleterious effects on other vascular cells like uh, vascular smooth muscle cells? Yeah, so, so that's like an interesting uh, question because uh, the effects of SARS-CoV-2 or uh, with the virus is not only in the thelia cells. We study in the thelia cells at first because it is the first barrier uh, of it. But uh, we did look at some other cells and uh, we concentrated in vascular smooth muscle cells and did a little bit of work in fibroblasts as well. That's because there are some studies that start to show that during COVID, you have changes in vascular tone uh, and uh, leading to more uh, con contraction or vasoconstriction and less endothelial, endothelial dysfunction, meaning like less relaxation. So what we see in vascular smooth muscle cells is that like uh, the recombinant S1 protein is seems to be increasing rho kinase activity, uh, increases not only the activity, but also the expression of rho gaps, which are very important to the uh, regulation of rho, rho A, rho kinase in vascular smooth muscle cells. And I can see in the chat here that Ilaria uh, is here with us. And it's good that she's here because uh, she spent some time in our lab and she started to see that uh, when you expose vascular smooth muscle cells to recombinant S1 protein, the effects in calcium influx are exacerbated. Uh, and these are all vascular smooth muscle cells that we got from facial arteries, like their surplus vessels from uh, maximum uh, buccal uh, facial rec reconstruction surgeries. Uh, and then, yeah, so basically what we see here is there is an increase in uh, molecular mechanism of contraction. 
but we also start to see that maybe the phenotype of this vascular smooth muscle cells is also uh, changed, where we may have a more pro-inflammatory, pro-fibrotic uh, phenotype. Um, and that's what we are at the moment in related to, uh, to that aspect. So you may have changes that contribute to contraction and changes that contribute to more inflammation and fibrosis. Okay, fantastic. Um, so since you mentioned um, Ilaria, in the, I'll read her question next. Um, so first it says, thank you, Guto, for your clear and interesting talk. Um, and then her question is, in COVID-19 patients, some articles reported um, a bradykinin storm. Moreover, bradykinin plays a pro-inflammatory role. Um, other than acting as a vasodilator, do you have any information about the involvement of bradykinin or an eventual crosstalk between ACE2 and BK or bradykinin in your cell model? Yeah, Eli, like that's a great question because ACE2 or uh, bradykinin will be affected uh, if you have changes in, uh, in some components of the RAS system as well. So like those two systems are kind of like hand to hand and they kind of like have like interconnections. but to answer your question, uh, honestly, like, no, we didn't look at any uh, things related to bradykinin. That's an interesting concept because it may, uh, we may see a potentiation or interaction between system. That's something that we would be interested, uh, but not only with bradykinin, but other systems that regulate endothelial cell inflammation and vascular function. Yeah, but the short answer for you, Larry, is that like, no, we didn't look at anything related to BK yet. Okay. Fantastic. All right. The next question here is, uh, when you studied ACE2 expression with the Western blot, was it at the cell surface or were you using whole cell lysate? Yeah, so, so that's like an interesting question. So we've done the whole cell uh, lysate and we used the, uh, and we've done also like in the microparticles, which is pretty much like uh, something from the cell membrane. Uh, we were able to identify uh, both types. I, I guess like the question may be leading to that. So like we were able to identify the short uh, form of a version of ACE2, but also like the, the long, the normal uh, ACE2. Um, it would be interesting to look at different compartments expression of ACE2 to try to dissect whether uh, there is a um, changes in the transition or um, movement of ACE2, but we didn't, we didn't do those experiments yet. Okay, great. Um, another question here, uh, does RS1P affect the PDGF, which I believe is the platelet-derived growth factors, um, expression or release from endothelial cells? Yeah, so there is some uh, studies showing the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 and recombinant SM protein with growth factors. We didn't look at that. We wanted to uh, to do some uh, ELISAs and some experiments looking at it, but we didn't complete those experiments. So I, I don't know if it's changing or not. It could uh, change it. So the only, no, the, but there is one that we saw was TGF beta uh, and we didn't see differences. Okay. Great, hopefully that answered your question. Um, another question here, uh, they're asking if you use pulmonary arterial endothelial cells. Yeah, so we used four different endothelial cells. We used not only the microvasculars, but microvascular, but also used the lymphatic endothelial cells, um, aortic and pulmonary uh, endothelial cells. Okay, perfect. Uh, another question here. Uh, first, it starts with beautiful presentation. Thank you. And the question is, did you measure interleukin-18 or IL-18 since it's been shown to be involved in inflammation in, in, in endothelial cells and is released by an inflammasome along with IL-1 beta in the endothelium? Yes, so we looked at uh, IL-1 beta and that's increased. IL-18, uh, we didn't see any uh, any changes. I just need to confirm uh, quickly. 
yeah so we've done uh, a multiplex uh, because we had like another study going at the same time so i was able to put some uh, samples in and we didn't see differences in IO18. Okay. Uh, next question here. Uh, do you have any vascular function data showing endothelial dysfunction in rodents? Yeah, so no. So that's like the next step that we like to take this project to. So we like to test all this in like in the ACE2 uh, knock-in models um, and then test the vascular physiology effects, let's say. Uh, so the only thing that we've done in collaboration with just a completely different study uh, that hopefully is going to be published soon was in, co in uh, gluteal arteries, uh, art like resistance arteries extract from gluteal biopsies. Uh, and that was like Professor Colin Berry's uh, study back in Glasgow. And he, we start to play a little bit with uh, this paradigm of COVID-19 inducing uh, changes in vascular function, but that's it. That's what we uh, contributed to in that study. But in our study, we still need to do those uh, physio like vascular function studies. Okay, so some in vivo work is in your future. Yeah. Oh, Sarah, just to, to add, uh, Francisco Rios was one of our uh, collaborators as well. So he was looking at interferon, uh, interferon gamma or interferon's response, and then he starts to see some changes in the vasculature that may be related to COVID-19. Okay, very cool. All right, another question here. Uh, I'm very interested to know if you have any insight on the potential role of ACE2 or endothelial dysfunction in long COVID symptoms. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting uh, question. I I don't know. Um, the problem with our studies, like we start to show that there is a role for ACE2 that's independent on uh, enzymatic function, right? But I don't know how um, chronic that change will be. So we still need to do, I think like the in vivo studies will let us answer that question better. I think like on that scenario, it will be a, um, we need to sort of like dissect what's this receptor like uh, function will lead to changes in the vasculature versus how that reflects on ACE2 uh, activity by changing the RAS system. So I think like, I guess like the, my insights that this would be a little bit more complex that we still, I, I still don't know exactly how that would play a role in long COVID without doing like an in vivo or a more vascular physiology, a better vascular physiology uh, studies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, that's in your future soon, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, would you expect differences in cells with the ACE2GG genotype, which has been related to severity or changing severity of COVID nineteen? Can you can you repeat, uh, Sarah? Yeah, sure. Um, would you expect differences in cells with the ACE2GG genotype? Uh, which has been related to the severity of COVID-19. Yeah, so um, I just need to um, remember what's the GG uh, phenotype. I think, wait, let me just... Uh, yeah, so, so Marisol, if you don't mind, give me like a little um, insight here, but I, I think like it's the overexpression of ACE2, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So I think like sure. anything, um, yeah, so I'm sorry, like I'm trying to search here, but I think that um, any changes in ACE2 expression may impact what we, what we are saying. And, and the reason behind that is because the what we show here is that ACE2 may be sitting in um, how can I say in a signaling hub 
which we think that may be like lipid rafts or uh, cavioli and so on. So if you change that, uh, anything related to expression or localization of ACE2, you may impact that. And that's like, uh, and that's what we are, we're thinking. I hope like that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, she clarified that uh, it's a polymorphism and ACE2 is overexpressed. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marisol. I just had like that, <laughs> that blank moment. <laughs> yeah, so I think like as I was saying, like it may be, we need to look right in models where we have like an overexpression because um, we don't know that may amplify the signal, right? So that may, uh, it depends if the overexpression is going to be a, is a localized overexpression or it's like throughout the cell membrane, is that going to induce like new interactions that we, uh, we don't know? So I think there's so much that can be changed by that phenotype that yes, it may have a uh, exacerbation of this effect. But then again, that's something that has to be tested. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, have any of these studies been re-examined with recombinant spike proteins from any of the other variants? Yeah, no, not yet. So like, uh, and that's like a, a, a good question. And especially because there's a recent paper that just came out suggesting uh, that uh, ACE2, no, not ACE2 inhibition, but ACE2, uh, treatment as a decoy receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is too uh, effective in uh, Omicron and the other variants. And so that suggests that those variants are still able to bind to ACE2. Uh, but with all the changes in the spike protein, we it would be interesting to know if it's like makes this activation more um, like better or less. So this, because we have changes in inflammation so basically the short answer is like no but it's very interesting you're looking forward to do that yeah excellent so many future studies um we've still got quite a bit more time for questions so if you have any more questions please submit them um and we still have a quite a few to go through so uh this next question is uh did you mark your microparticles to know if they are exosomes or extracellular vesicles yeah, so no, we just did like the, the nanocyte experiments where we were able to separate by size. So the only the only uh, quantification that we've done was the uh, different them by size. Uh, but we, we wanted to uh, look at different markers like using flow cytometry to see like where, um, to see what's the components and, and have like a better characterization of that population of microparticles. Okay, great. Um, another question here. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, do you check ENOS? Um, I think this is SEER 1177 phosphorylation um, for phosphorylations at that site or any other sites. Yeah, so the one we've looked at uh, serine 1177, which is the activation site, and we didn't see differences. We also looked at the serine uh, 3 and then uh, 495, which is the inactivation site, and also like no differences. Um, and then since we didn't see differences of both, we didn't measure nitro oxide. So we pretty much like stopped uh, the studies uh, there. Okay, great. And how did you measure ROS in this study? So we've done uh, the lucigenin chemiluminescence just to give like a quick readout of general ROS and see if there's uh, something uh, happening. And we didn't see differences. We also uh, used Amplex Red to have a look at HCO2 and we didn't see uh, differences. But for those studies, uh, we only done uh, at like the short term because we're thinking of ROS would be more like a signaling uh, Pro like signaling mechanism, but we still need to repeat those uh, experiments in longer term because ROS can be cyclic, and then uh, I would like to confirm that, right? And because can be cyclic and can be like the increase can be a little slower depending on the situation, uh, we need to look at time a bit a longer time points. It's like the 24 hours when you see the increase in uh, pro-inflammatory molecules. 
Would I think that we would, that would make a difference? Mostly not, because we didn't see, usually changes in ROS will change at least some of the expression of the antioxidant panels that we look into it, or NERV2 as well, and we didn't see changes on that. But I still would like to do those experiments just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, another question here. Uh, is there any work being done to target ACE2 activity as a therapeutic target for COVID-19? Um, so there, there are like a few studies uh, suggesting that if you push the system to ACE2 activity leading to angiotensin 1 to 7 uh, production and actions, it's protective against like inflammation. Uh, and those studies, I think like right now, like are still uh, in their infancy. And uh, it's based on the premise that angiotensin 2 levels may be increased during COVID because of the, the lack or the decrease in ACE2 activity. Um, so I just mentioned the other study that's using ACE2, but more like a soluble ACE2 uh, as a decoy receptor for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, great. All right, uh, another question here. Uh, related to the methods a bit. Um, the cells that you used, were they commercial human microvascular endothelial cells? Yes, so uh, because we, uh, during COVID we had lab closures and we couldn't continue with like our uh, cell uh, extractions. So we had to go for like commercial cells. So those are primary cultures, but from commercial sources for all of them. Apart okay. from the vascular book, vascular cells. Great. Um, just looking at the time here, I think I'm going to make this our last question. Um, this question is: Do you think microparticle shedding um, is a cellular protective effect against infection, um, and what is triggering the microparticle production? All right. So. Um, the first part, like if it's a cellular protective effect, I think it can be um, because you're removing ACE2 from uh, this, like say signaling hub. So it can be like a way that your cells are trying to remove that uh, signaling component or the additional effect of ACE2 or the additional, additional fun uh, pro-inflammatory function of ACE2. Now, does it, become uh, long-term protective? I don't know because that I think for sure will impact the activity or the importance of ACE2 in breaking down angiotensin 1 to 7. So this is why that was my comment for the long COVID. Like, I think like this, we need to understand better, right? Like this uh, enzymatic versus no enzymatic function to understand what would be beneficial deleterious in the long term. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, I, th I think it could be a protective effect, like to remove the ACE2 from the that signaling hub from the picture and stop um, these pro-inflammatory actions. And now what is triggering my microparticles micro production? So there are a few uh, proteins, signaling proteins, but when we've done our proteomics and we start to see that uh, a few of these proteins are cytoskeleton, but also like uh, adapter proteins in the cell membrane that can activate uh, enzymes that will cleave proteins and then may participate in microparticles. And in another set of studies, what we start to see is that uh, ADAN17 may play a role on this. So uh, these effects of ACE, uh, these effects of recombinant S1 protein could be also be inhibited by uh, ADAN17 uh, inhibition. So one of the one of the possible mechanisms that I would say is ADN17 activity plus a few other uh, proteins that we see in the proteomics studies. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I totally lied. I'm going to ask you one more question because we have a bit of time. Um, and it just came in and it's great. <laughs> uh, can you give an overview on your thoughts on blood pressure medications that work on ACE um, as they may relate to their potential value in treating acute and chronic COVID-19. Yes, so that's a very good and interesting question. Um, and there is like a, a lot, the, 
there's a lot of discussions in whether uh, you know ACE, ACE inhibitors would affect or be uh, involved in uh, COVID-19 or the treatment of COVID-19 or even like increase the side of, of the bad effects of COVID-19. So I there are studies in animal models that show that inhibition of ACE leads to upregulation of ACE2 and uh, production of angiotensin 1 to 7. And that's like thought to be one of the mechanisms whereby that it's a whereby this treatment leads to cardiovascular protection. So um, I don't think like uh, so my short answer here is that like I think like the I wouldn't stop like I'm not a physician or anything but like please don't take this there is our results as something to say that people should stop taking uh, their ACE inhibitors because they're going to have side effects. I think like for us to start understanding what's this relationship, like uh, we first need to confirm that in humans, uh, ACE inhibitors lead to ACE2 upregulation. Uh, that's because, as I said, all these studies were done in animal models. We still have like a lot to do in terms of human studies to confirm that. And my other thing is we need to better understand what is this uh, relationship or what is this uh, other function of ACE2 in the vasculature. And if that overcomes or has an impact in the in ACE2 uh, enzymatic function. Because I say that because I think the receptor-like domain, it is, although we show here that it's very pro-inflammatory, I think there's much more complexity to it because when you look at our proteomics data, there's also some proteins there that are uh, protective or may have protective effects. So I think like it depends on the, this, it may depend on the stimulus, it may depend on many other aspects that we need to understand better before assuming that there would be a mechanism where ACE inhibition and increase in ACE2 expression would lead to more deleterious effects. But so far, I would say it's still protective and that ACE inhibition seems to have uh, good effects in the vasculature or in the cardiovascular system due to increased activity of ACE2. Amazing. I just really want to thank you so much uh, for your insights today. It's been a pleasure to have you with us, and I really hope that you had fun. Yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to the, the American Physiological Society and for the European Council of Cardiovascular Research for uh, choosing me to represent them in this uh, seminar. I'm very happy, and thank you so much, guys. This interaction is, like, priceless. Fantastic. I'm really, really happy that you feel that way because we feel the same way. So thank you again. All right. And I also want to thank the audience. Thank you for joining us live. Um, these events are for you, but they're not possible without you. In closing, we hope that you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research. And we look forward to having you with us for the rest of the series. Thank you.